Welcome everybody. Today is Saturday and once again it's Dr. Doug's All Things Animal. We're very excited uh, about our topic today. My special co-host, always beautiful and bright, Cindy oh, Vickers. Thank you. I'm, I'm pushing for something. I'm not yeah, sure what. Yeah, I know. What, I mean, because you said something inappropriate probably earlier, but thank you so much for that. <laughs> and we today we are going to have a very special guest from Nestle's Purina. It's Gail Zarnecki. She's a nutritionist there, and she has a lot of information about what's a normal, we call it a biome or the physiological yeah. environment in the pet's gut. And we're going to be talking today about how that impacts nutrition in our pets, our dogs and cats. So um, why don't we start with um, any questions from from Cindy? I have many, many questions because I am kind of a nutrition freak myself. And I am literally bombarded with emails every day because I, you know, I click on something to find out information and it's really overwhelming. But so there's just uh, information out there for people that is ju it's just conflicting all the time. Mm -hmm. You are the you're kind of the guru here. Uh, well, there's doctor, so much information, Doctor Zarnecki. Yeah. And it, how does it compare to human nutrition? I mean, is it the same thing? And should I be giving my dog a you know D three vitamin? Like, tell me what is how does it compare? As a general rule, <laughs> as yeah. a general rule. Um, Dogs are much more similar to humans than cats are, for sure, because cats are strict carnivores and dogs aren't. But there are differences between dogs and humans as well. You know, I think in some areas where we know a lot more about dog nutrition, um, really especially in some of the more recent areas um, where we're looking at how does, how does your nutrition affect um, longevity and how does it affect your overall health. It's um, a lot easier to do some of the studies in dogs than it is in people. Um, you can do a, there was a longevity study, for example, that um, came out with dogs a couple of years ago where they showed that by feeding less food and keeping the dogs lean, they w could live two years longer. Wow. And you can do that kind of study in, a, you know, in dogs in 15 years, but with humans, you'd be talking about doing a 100 year long study. So I think there's certain areas that we know a lot more about dog nutrition than we do in people. And there's probably examples the other way around as well, too. Well, I would ask, um, uh, do you think that change is something that's evolved over time? In other words, uh, dogs were considered or are considered carnivores still, but uh, not the strict carnivores you mentioned that cats are. Yeah, dogs are really more omnivores than they are carnivores. They they can digest carbohydrates fairly well. So for our audience, that means uh, we, we classify animals um, that have backbones as carnivores or omnivores or herm herbivores, depending on what their diet is. But the interesting thing is that it affects and impacts how Mother Nature has created their, the anatomy mm -hmm. of their GI tract or their intestinal tract, and starting with their teeth. Yeah. And it becomes a very interesting comparative study. Yeah. Okay, so you can't transfer necessarily, if you learn something about dogs that's not necessarily transferable, that same scientific information does not necessarily apply to cats, does not necessarily apply to humans, but we're closer to dogs and people. Right, and, and there are some things that are the same. Um, obviously, dogs and cats and humans all get diabetes, but there's differences between them. Um, so there's some areas within nutrition that are very similar across species, and there's some that are very different. It's very individual as far as what it goes. Well, I find that the commercial um, dog foods, that we only use prescription dog foods in our clinic, uh, at the veterinary clinic, but I note that every time a new product comes out, one of the manufacturers comes to us, gives us a demonstration and a presentation, and they're trying more and more to kind of combine multiple functions into the mm -hmm. food stuff so that if you have kidney problems or you got heart problems or you're obese you're trying to it sounds like the manufacturers are recognizing how much more important that is for our pet care mm -hmm. and is that is that what you see at nestle's perina that a lot of the philosophy goes towards uh trying to get the right diet uh collectively yeah especially you know when you're an older animal there's a, there's obviously a lot of health concerns that can be affected by diet and by dietary therapy um, for younger animals, it's it's not as important to. I mean, but there are individual differences between different dogs and different cats. And what I always tell people is, you know, you, you pick a diet, you see how well your animal is doing on it. If they've got a nice shiny coat, then that diet's fine for them. It could be that if you've got 
you know, a couple animals in your household, one might do better on one diet and the other might do better on a different diet because some dogs have a lot of hair, some dogs are more muscular, and there's just individual variability in what the requirements are. Good, good. Okay, so that sort of is a natural progression to me, what we were saying before about uh, about dogs being similar to people. And so people have said to me, um, just feed your dog whatever you eat. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that? <laughs> I think there's a couple things with that. Number one, I think most of us don't necessarily eat a balanced diet. Mm. Um, but the other thing is oh, that you know even, me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know I don't. Um, but the other thing is that I think a lot of people, when they're feeding their dog what they eat, they don't necessarily feed them everything they eat. And even if they offer everything they eat to the dog, the dog doesn't necessarily eat everything. Um, so there was actually a study that was recently published from the University of California, Davis, where they looked at um, homemade diets for dogs and looked at how adequate those recipes were at meeting the dog's nutritional needs and found that there were a number of um, very common deficiencies um, when they compared them to what the dog's nutrient requirements actually were. So I think if you are gonna to feed them what you what you're eating to make sure that you have somebody who's got a degree in nutrition looking at the nu nutrient balance of the diet. Um, I can tell you a gazillion years ago, back when I was in grad school and probably for 20 years after that, um, we never saw signs of nutritional deficiencies in dogs. People were pretty much feeding commercial foods and lately people have gone more to homemade diets and now they're starting to, in the literature starting to be case studies of dogs with calcium deficiency, for example, showing up. So mm -hmm. you just you can feed them homemade foods, you just need to make sure that they're balanced properly. So it's not impossible to do, but it's a whole lot easier just to feed a commercial diet that has been proven to be nutritionally complete. And we are a unique society in the United States and probably in Europe and places like Australia in particular. We treat our pets like our family and uh, we feed them. We, we're the only, I tell people we're the only place that I know, those particular places I mentioned, um, where people eat, you know, no, no less value or uh, the, I guess the animals are the ones that mm -hmm. are eating just as well as the people. You go to any other country that's less developed and those people would love to have the nutrition that we give our pets. Mm -hmm. And I always yeah. think that's kind of funny and when people, the com one of the most common questions at the veterinary clinic is, what should I feed my dog? And you know, which product? And I go, well, God, you know, there are so many options. And you know, I said, I think if you pick any particular well-known manufacturer, you're probably going to be in the ball game, mm -hmm. and then you'll learn as your animal ages if there are special needs. You're going to have to search out the companies that provide the special need products, and I think that's the best way to right. to handle it. But uh, I one question myself is, uh, how important are vitamins? Because you know, I hear so many stories, even in humans, they go, after so many years of pushing vitamins on kids, now they say, well, if you're eating a balanced diet, you shouldn't need a lot of these vitamins. I think if you're talking about supplements, if you're feeding a commercial food, they have enough vitamins in them to meet the requirements, and you have to be careful that you don't overdo it because you could cause a toxicity. Mm -hmm. And so if you gave a human vitamin to a Yorkie, for example, that's a lot of extra vitamins that that dog would be getting. So and after you, process. Right. So in some of those, they can store in the body. Some of them, you know, immediately go back out if they don't um, consume, you know, don't need them. So that's something you need to watch out for. I always tell people if your dog's not or your cat's not doing well on a diet, switch to a different diet instead of adding supplements unless mm -hmm. it has a special health problem. I got you. That's like that so. new commercial that's out that, uh, no, I didn't pick the wrong lawyer. I picked the wrong law firm. <laughs> so, <laughs> go ahead. Well, yeah, okay, so for me, this is like the elephant in the room because I have heard more, I have had more conversations about this and probably said more things about this that I was probably not even qualified to say, and it is corn. Mm -hmm. um, corn being the number one ingredient in some dog foods and corn, is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Uh, should they not have grains? And, and I wonder, is it just something that we use because it's cheaper and so it's this is the most you can afford, it's okay, but you know, what, what do you say about corn? So I'll tell you that when we're, um, when we're formulating diets at companies, 
um, we're, we're looking at the ingredients, but we're looking at them differently than a consumer does because what we're looking at is trying to make sure that the diet's nutritionally complete. And there's no one ingredient that would meet all the requirements of an animal. Maybe eggs would probably come the closest, but that would be really expensive to just feed your dog eggs. So what you have to do is you take, you know, here's, here's a, a grain, for example, and you mix that with this other grain and with this meat. And then when you mix those all together, you end up with the ideal balance of amino acids. So in corn, counterbalances a lot of the other ingredients that are used in pet food, which is why it was used originally. And a lot of the livestock foods have a lot of corn in them because they complement, you know, amino acids that are high in corn are low in some of the other common protein sources and vice versa. So it's really more the nutrients that you need to look at rather than where the nutrients are coming from. And I would love to think that, you know, if a dog or I couldn't utilize corn, then I could live on corn and never gain weight. But I can tell you, I, you know, you gain a lot of weight eating Fritos or, you know, and even corn on the cob, mm-hmm. you know, you still gain weight. They're still digesting it um, and I absorbing love corn it. On the cob. <laughs> I know. I, I had a question. Um, you know, as a veterinarian, when we have pets come into the clinic, the value of a physical exam is to give us a chance, get our hands on the animal. But, you know, one of the things we think about, we're thinking about nutrition, but directly we're looking for signs that might reflect a poor nutritional state. Mm -hmm. So there are obvious things. An animal comes in and he's emaciated, we know that something's wrong. Um, If an animal's having chronic diarrhea, then we know something's wrong. Um, But as a veterinarian, I start at the head, I look at the teeth and the condition of the teeth as a reflection mm-hmm. of nutrition and how the animal processes food. I look at the general body condition that we talked about, uh, and then finally, uh, what comes out the other end. Mm-hmm. Now I understand that you're dubbed the poop queen. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, it's uh, I don't know if that's from your husband calls you that. No, or they, they call, call me that. they call me that at work. Oh, okay. So. Can you uh, elaborate a little bit, poop queen? So, so one of the areas that I specialize in is digestive health. And so we do a lot of work looking at, um, looking at the, the feces of the, the animal and using that as an indication of their health, but also of ways that we can improve their health because basically everything starts in the gut. The gut is a barrier from bad things getting into the body. It's how you absorb your nutrients, but there's a lot of um, research going on lately showing how the bacteria in your gut uh, communicate with the rest of your body and send signals to the brain, for example. Um, it's really a fascinating area. And humans, too. And humans, too. I love yeah. this. So do you like and the probiotic concept that an animal or a human should be on probiotics all the time? Or? I think it's not a bad thing. Um, probiotics are an interesting area because there's a lot of, I think a lot of people use that term very generically, and it's really not a generic term. And I've heard people say, well, my dog has on and off he has diarrhea, I tried a probiotic, it doesn't work, so I don't believe in probiotics. Or they use yogurt all the time. Yeah, and even in with yogurts, there are probiotic yogurts and there's yogurts that, even though they have cultures to make them, they're not really probiotics. A probiotic has to be um, live bacteria that has a benefit to the animal or to the host, be it human or animal. But I think the thing to keep in mind with probiotics is they're different. So even if you have two bacteria that have identical names, they can have very different effects within the animal. So some might stimulate the immune system so you get a better response to a vaccine, for example, or you might be better off, um, better able to fight infections, and others might be anti-inflammatory, so they have a better effect at um, maybe combating arthritis or inflammation. Mm -hmm. And you could have two bacteria that have exactly the same names, but they're different strains. So for example, if you, if you wanted, you went to a um, Michael Jordan convention, for example, and you mm-hmm. had 100 Michael Jordans in a room, you know, there might be the Michael Jordan that everyone knows who's a great basketball player, and so you might randomly pick him to, to shoot baskets for you. You could pick a different Michael Jordan, and they, they're a great artist and have no clue how to play basketball. And it's really the same way with the bacteria as well. It's really strain-specific. So you really can't make a lot of generalizations about probiotics that way. Well, and a good point real quickly, we're gonna be closing real quick, but um, I always tell people that um, 
you know, they ask, well, why did my dog get diarrhea when I changed diets? It's mm -hmm. one of the more common problems, especially in puppies, but it could right. be any animal. Animals that come out of rescue, they're mm -hmm. on one diet, they come into our home, we've got them on another diet. And I kind of explain it the same way that there's the Smiths and the Jones, two mm -hmm. groups living in the neighborhood, and one food supports more Smiths growing than Joneses. And then when you switch to diet too quickly, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden there's, uh, they're confused, and all of a sudden you got a surge in the, the Jones and now the Smiths are declining and you get this change and you get diarrhea. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. but so are probiotics in the food? Are, are they coming into the food? Do we, and is it, I mean, I, I don't know what to do with this information. Am I supposed to supplement my dog's diet or cat's diet Typically, probiotics? Yeah, typically probiotics won't be in the food because um, probiotics are live bacteria, so you have to feed them separately. Yeah, the, probably they wouldn't allow that in the industry. Well, I think we're just about losing our time. So I just want to uh, thank our, our special guest, Gail, and we're gonna be back in a few minutes after uh, our little break, and Dr. Doug's All Things Animals will continue with some phone calls from our listening group. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. We're here with, of course, Cindy Vickers, our co-host, and our special guest from Nestle's Purina, Gail Zarnecki, who is, a again, once again, a nutritionist there. And uh, we're going to be continuing with some phone call questions regarding pet nutrition. So I think we have some people online waiting for us. And let's go ahead and start with line one. Laura, is that you at line one? Yes, it is. Hi, Laura. This is Dr. Pernikoff and Cindy. Hi, Laura. Uh, and our special guest, Gail. We're here to answer any questions regarding your pet's nutrition, so go fire away. Um, I'm struggling with whether to use dry food or wet food with okay. our pets at home. Okay. And not sure which is healthier or which one, if maybe the wet food would cause them to gain too much unneeded weight, or if it's not as good for the system, or maybe even grain-free would be better. So there's just so much on the market out there to try and sway us one direction or the other and need your opinion. Great question, and I'm gonna direct that to Gail to hit it up. You're not gonna direct it to me? Oh, okay. Would no, you? I don't know anything about it. Okay, so good. Yeah. <laughs> Back to Gail. <laughs> you know, as far as the wet versus the dry go, it's, it's really more a matter of what your dog or cat prefers to eat. Um, with cats, I find that a lot of times they'll um, develop a prefer preference for one of the two and it starts to get kind of hard to switch them. And with cats, you don't want to have them, um, with dogs eventually they'll start eating if you switch to something they don't like. So say you're feeding wet food and you switch them over to dry. With cats, um, cats if they stop eating for a while, um, they can actually get very sick and get hepatic lipidosis, which Dr. Doug could tell you a whole lot more Fatty about. Fatty liver than. syndrome. <clears throat> So you need to be a little bit careful mm -hmm. when you're trying to change food with dogs. But really, basically, if the if they look good, the I always go by how good does the dog or cat look when they're eating the food because the nutrients that are going to their hair basically the you know they'll they'll prioritize where the nutrients go. So they're going to go to keep the dog or cat alive first. They're going to go to the immune function, and if there's enough left over, they basically go into um, creating a good hair coat because you don't really need their hair to survive. So if they look really good, they've got a good glossy coat, then obviously that food's good for them. You wanna make sure that the label says it's nutritionally complete and balanced. Um, but other than that, it's really more a matter of um, what they prefer to eat, honestly. So how about... Um, so the wet food would not lead to more weight gain. No, if anything, it they actually... It seems like they all want the wet food. I mean, yeah. they take the wet food out and they just voraciously gobble it. There was actually an old study that was done by the at the University of California at Davis, and they were trying to actually purposely make cats overweight, and they they tried to feed them wet food to do that, and they actually didn't gain weight on the wet food. They actually tend to gain hmm. more weight on dry food than wet a lot of times. Let me interject. I um, I always tell people that today we're reevaluating our pet foods. For so many years, we were doing strictly grain-based diets. And we thought that was good because we could standardize the quality and uh, longevity of these products in the, for the stores. But the reality is that these animals are, that we deal with are mostly carnivores, right? And historically, mm -hmm. uh, Mother Nature taught them to eat food, protein, and fat. And so I'm asking Gail myself, 
uh, this uh, a curve away from grain, strictly grain-based mm -hmm. diets. Um, are you in a, a agreement with that, that we should reconsider that? I, you know, there's really no scientific evidence showing that that's better. Dogs um, evolved away from wolves. Wolves are more carnivor carnivorous. There's actually recent data showing that dogs are have developed a better starch carbohydrate utilization system than wolves have. And they really need the nutrients that are in the ingredients. It's not really so important what ingredients the nutrients are coming from, it's what the nutrients are. So when you're absorbing protein, your body isn't looking at, oh, did that come from grain or did that come from chicken or did it come from duck or, or whatever. It's just, you know, this is the type of protein I need and this is the balance of the amino acids and the protein that I need. It doesn't really matter so much where they came from. Oh, good, that's interesting. So, Contrary to what I always believe, but it's good mm -hmm. information. How about the concept of the wet food uh, versus the dry food? And we also like to tell our clients, especially cat owners, that uh, we like to keep them, they produce metabolic water from digestion. Mm -hmm. But is that adequate if we wanna get them hydrated? Is it useful to use a wet diet or just soften the, the grain-based diets with uh, some water? I think they will stay better hydrated with wet food if you have a cat who's tending to get dehydrated. Um, so that's true. Um, now I, I think about that in application towards uh, the common kidney and bladder mm -hmm. stone problems. And are we are we really helping our people by telling them, yeah, feed feed more water, or do this, or get the wet foods because we're going to further minimize that. And I, again, I could probably argue myself that. Um, it may not always be important because I know these diets that are prepared specifically mm -hmm. for special conditions uh, aren't always wet. Right, right. And I think if you have an older animal who isn't getting up to get water because maybe they're arthritic, mm -hmm. if you have more moisture coming in mm -hmm. from the food, then they have to rely less on going to the water bowl. Um, the one thing I would mention about wet foods is that um, if you're feeding only wet food, um, that can cause some issues with dental health. So you need to have something for them to chew on as well. Um, that's a really good point. And that's a yeah, natural thing that, the, that, yeah, the dry foods are gonna tend to help keep plaque and tartar from accumulating more than the wet foods will. Wow, I kind of so. thought just the opposite, you know, that, that they work that um, grain diet or that kibble diet, and then that just pushes um, and packs up kind of oh. that dry food on there, whereas the wet foods I thought would be digested or swallowed easier, but I could be wrong. There. Well, and I wonder if there's ever been any real study just on that. Like, I mean, people have what they believe is to, um, they, you know, they've heard that, that if mm -hmm. you, you need dry food to keep your teeth cleaner or, or like she, this woman heard, I, I have, um, I heard that wet food uh, makes cats fatter, but has there been any study that says like, they really that dry food or wet food it has an impact on their dental health? I, I mean, we don't yeah. really know. I don't think. I don't know if it's been published. I know I've seen internal studies at Purino, and I've seen pictures of teeth of cats that were only on wet food versus dry food, and they were much cleaner on dry food. And I know way back mm. a zillion years ago, um, I actually did a study on rawhides. And looking at rawhide's effectiveness on, and there's some published work on that too, on um, teeth. And basically, if they're chewing with their teeth, that tends to wear off the tartar more than if they're not. Problem is, and, again, as carnivores, and it sounds like they eat differently than mm -hmm. the wild animals, but as carnivores, they tend to just swallow and they use teeth to grasp, but they're not going to use as much of the pulverizing effort of the molars and premolars like herbivores do. Mm -hmm. But um, no, it's a good point and it's interesting. And I hope uh, that was useful, Laura. Uh, let us know yeah, if you ever. Was. I do have one more question for you for speaking of the dental health. Did you pay extra the money part. for this or? for the opportunity <laughs> no, go ahead i'm still very fortunate that i was able to get through go ahead but, uh, for years i've been giving our dogs butcher bones from the butcher raw you know i go up and i say do you have any dog bones they kindly cut them for me and i give them those bones with the marrow and everything and i've told myself i give them to them not only do they love them but i was hoping that it was helping with their dental care mm -hmm. keeping their teeth looking good what are your thoughts about giving those raw butcher bones to the dogs and is it okay for that amount of fat for them to be consuming from the marrow there's probably you know i guess it depends on how big your dogs are and how big the bone is but i'm guessing there's probably not enough fat in there to really imbalance their diet um i would worry more about the raw just to make sure that um 
you're not inadvertently giving them any kind of pathogens. I know that if you do therapy dog visits, for example, um, one of the main therapy dog organizations, Pet Partners, will not allow dogs to do therapy dog visits if they're fed raw foods because the chance of um, oh. passing pathogens on goes up. That's interesting. And yeah. the American Veterinary Medical oh. Association actually has a, um, a statement about that as well. I tend to, when I get those types of things in, I'll, co- I'll cook them, you know, just to kill off anything. But I do therapy dog visits with my dogs, so... Um, you know, you I've can, had a, you can I feed raw food. I thought we and, couldn't give cooked bones. I didn't realize <laughs> you could give cooked bones to dogs. I've always avoided that. That's a question for Dr. Doug, because it really depends yeah. on the type of bone, doesn't it? Yeah, whether see, they're likely I was to a, splinter. I was, yeah, exactly. I was a uh, veterinarian at the emergency programs, and um, I can tell you it's not a problem till it's a problem, but we saw many, many animals that were trying to work bones, like the big marrow bones. They get them caught in the teeth or in the back of their mouth, or as Gail was suggesting, chicken bones that splinter so easily. Oh, these, yeah. these things can cause real problems. So. I think there's enough alternative there that I'm not a fan of it, but you know, you can talk to 10 people and get 10 different opinions about mm-hmm. that. And you talk to some of these hunters with their working dogs and they can't wait to give them a treat like that. And again, until it's a problem, it's not a problem, but in my own personal professional experience, I would say minimize it or don't do it, okay? I, I'd like to add one thing to that and I, um, I'm, I'm certainly not uh, personally, anti bone. However, sometimes you think, oh, this dog, it's, this is big, hard bone, and he'll have it forever. And then, but some of these dogs work these bones down mm-hmm. to little chunks that really that they can uh-huh. choke on. And the other thing is, you have multiple pets. Sometimes that's a very, very high value treat. So you just want to. I would be careful not to necessarily give them to the dogs all together. Like maybe you have to go in your crate or something oh, to have Mike that. Creates yeah, we never do that. They're, they're always yeah. separated. Yeah. Yeah. Laura, okay. thank oh. you so much, and hopefully we'll talk to you again in the future sometime. Good luck. Thank you very much for your time. Bye bye. Bye, Laura. Uh, on line two, we have uh, another friend uh, visitor, uh, Texan. Okay. Are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, how are you? This is Dr. Pernikoff here at the Dr. Doug's All Things Radio, uh, All Things Animal radio show. I have to, before you even ask the question, Texan, I have to say that I've never heard this name in my life, and I think it's pretty interesting. (laughs) And I thought that you were either from Texas or there's going to be a Tex-Mex attachment to this. I am, and my mother actually went to high school um, with a girl named Texan, and they were best friends. And she was homecoming queen, and my mom always looked up to her and stuff, and so I'm named after her. Okay. Cool. We, I have a daughter, Texan Jr., and we are from Texas, Fort Worth. See, there you go. Well, we're, we thought you were an exotic dancer. That was just, it wasn't really my idea, but. <laughs> I know, everybody, people will say, is that your real name? And I look like an exotic dancer, so. Awesome, <laughs> awesome. Whatever that looks like. So, I don't... When I go, and then when I lived in Vegas, I was in Vegas, I lived there for 15 years, and I have a law degree, okay? So I would go in places, and they'd be like, where, where are you from? And I'm like, oh, Vegas. And they'd be like, mm-hmm. I'm like, you're a dancer, right? And I'm like, oh, I get so mad. I have a law degree. And they're like, sure you do, girl. That's great. <laughs> well, Texan, tell us about uh, your question or your problem with your pet. Well, I have a bulldog, so he's naturally fat. And so I probably overfeed. I think I tend to, you should see my husband. I tend to overfeed things. So I'm wondering how many times a day should I feed him? It's a good question. Gail, do you want to jump on? You know, I don't know if it's so much a matter of how many times you feed them as how much you feed them. And I like to actually weigh out my dog's food when I'm trying to get them to lose weight. And I know there was a study that was published fairly recently where they saw that if people were using cups to measure their their dog's food, that they would, even though they... The first time they did it, you know, they got the right amount. They tended to add a little bit more every day. So it went from a level cup to a little bit of a heaping cup, and you're giving quite a bit more calories by the end of it. Um, Whereas if you actually weigh it with one of those little kitchen scales, um, you tend to be a lot more accurate and more consistent from day to day. So I should only feed him a cup a day? Oh, no, no. That was just an example. Oh. I oh, would say you so have to, number one. Me, I was like, man, I have been over 50. Yeah, that would, that would not be much <laughs> well, food for a bulldog. Texan, most <laughs> products most products you can buy commercially have a feeding chart mm-hmm. on there. And it's not something that you, uh, 
adhere to strictly uh, because you know I always tease and say that the company is trying to sell dog food but they should be pretty darn accurate and depending on the weight range that you feel like or your veterinarian helps you decide is best for your dog I would kind of use that as a guideline mm -hmm. along with what you find on the oh, label okay. and even though I think you're fantastic Texan I think that it's not necessarily so that bulldogs are fat they're <laughs> They're broad and they're uh, muscular. Thank you. I say that about myself. But, well, and Doug looks a little bit like a bulldog, uh, but I, they're not necessarily really fat. That's not to their advantage. Is, I was thinking correct me that, if so. I'm wrong on that. Yeah, were yeah, you was, thinking what I was thinking? I was thinking no, oh my God. Like so great. Body structure. Well, you know, I can tell you something that was also very. I've been to a couple of the a couple of the different companies manufacturing plants for dog foods, uh -huh. and today. Some of the science is so sophisticated and it becomes so specific that they even look at specific breeds and decide that they're... Yeah, I buy a bulldog specific. There you go. Yeah, and I thought that was really just interesting. Mm -hmm. We're going to do kibble for French for, bulldogs or... Yeah, I do yeah. it for flash ones with yeah, them, though. that's great. I yeah. had I had to tell a cute story about feeding according to the um, bag. So I was at somebody's. I, I agree with you. This is where you start. Look at the bag, mm -hmm. and it says start. And then if your dog is gaining too much weight, or your cat, then you, you have to give them less. Mm -hmm. If it's not enough, you give them more. But I went to somebody's house years ago, and they had an I an Irish setter and these people were so sweet and so concerned about their dog and they could the issue they had was the dog counter surfing and stealing food and it was out of control and so um, they wanted to do training for this and so when I met them I I was petting the dog and I'm like oh my god this dog is emaciated the dog was so skinny it was crazy and so I said well um how much are you feeding the dog they said we're feeding whatever it was we're feeding in two cups it's what's on the bag I said your dog is hungry and I so they just started feeding the dog more and problem solved yeah. So you have to really kind of look at your dog. Right. Yeah. And also use your vet, too, as mm -hmm. a guide. When you go in for your exams once or twice a, a year, that's a good time to get a, a check on your weight. And then many vets will let you come in and just step mm -hmm. on the scale, and they're not going to charge you for an office call. But if there's some program to, um, because obesity is such a problem in animals as well as humans, that... Um, they would be happy for you to come in and recheck periodically and then assess what kind of changes might be necessary with your foodstuffs or amount, volume, frequency. And just to clarify, yeah. you don't have to step on the scale like Doug said. You're, you can put your oh, dog on the, the scale, scale or your cat. Yeah. Am I going to step on the scale? Yeah, yeah. Then you wouldn't come in, I know. So. And I saw yeah, you were going to say something. Well, girl good. would. Yeah, well, and the feeding <laughs> dirt. like bake the scale so like when you first get on, it's like minus 10 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's my yeah. scale. Then it's like, sure, I'll get on now. <laughs> well, I, I think the thing to keep in mind with the feeding directions is they're an average. So a lot of dogs are going to need less food than that or a lot are going to need more. So what you want to do is feel your dog and you want to be able to easily feel their ribs without looking at them and seeing their ribs poking out and their backbone poking out. So you want to go by what what they feel like. I also, well, so. I, I like to look at, and there are uh, food condition charts that mm -hmm. most vets have that show just what Gail's describing. Uh, but for me, I tell people, you're always going to feel the spine, whether it's a perfectly conditioned dog or not. You'll feel mm -hmm. some aspect of the spine. But what I look for uh -huh. is just past the rib cage and before the pelvis or the hips, there's an area there that has the tenderloin, and that's where the waist of the dog is. And I think that's a good guide uh, in many cases, and your vet can help guide you to look at that confirmation, and often you'll see the balance there, or when they're losing too much weight, then they get more, much more prominently thin there. So, okay, I'm horrified at what you just said. I know. What I said. Because I don't think the you didn't even notice it. Yeah. Is that you too? Yeah. Because you called it the tenderloin. It's like it's a cow, tenderloin. like you're going to eat it. Well, it's like it's like quadratus <laughs> lumborum, or what is it? It's. <laughs> It's, I mean, it's... <laughs> Actually, it's the hypospadias, and um, there's another name. But, yeah, it's the it's actually what becomes in a, a cow I know, is the tenderloin area. So can't say I didn't that. know you we were such a sensitive human being. Well, I, I am. Okay, I'm, there you go. Well, Texan, thank you so much for the call, and hopefully you'll keep listening. Well, and thank you for the answers. It's yeah. great talking to you. It was very you. informative. Thank you. Okay. Bye, bye Bye. And then I was just wondering, Texan, when are you dancing again? <laughs> I thought you'd kept that one out. <laughs> we have one more uh, caller on line three, and that's uh, Jan. Jan, are you there? 
Hi, Jan. Uh, yeah, this is Jan. How are you? Good. This is Dr. Pernikoff, Cindy Vickers, and our special guest, Gail Zarnecki. She's our nutritionist. Uh, do you have a question about your dog or pet or cat's uh, nutrition? Yeah, I actually do. I have multiple cats, and one has um, issues with stones. And so we got her on a prescription diet, the Hill CD diet, the MultiCare. It's just that since I have multiple cats, is there anything comparable, like over-the-counter, where it would help with the stones, but yet I can feed to all my cats? Go ahead, and I'll respond to that as well. Yeah, I was going to say, if your cat actually has stones, I always refer those back to veterinarians. If you have a cat Mm -hmm. um, who might, you know, you're just trying to prevent stones, it's a different story. But if they've actually had stones, I would think she's meaning. I think she's probably implying how would you manage cats that have a history of getting stones or yeah she's had histories of stones so let's and assume that the, all we're taking care of yeah i yeah. would assume yeah. that the surgery has been done or you don't want to have a surgery mm-hmm. you know somebody's cat had surgery so then um how about managing is it better to use a commercial uh diet that suggests it does that or is that one we want to send to the veterinarian for one of the special prescription foods to me it it depends on your situation and i would definitely talk to your veterinarian about that and see what they um, recommend but they a lot of the commercial foods are um, formulated to uh, produce an ideal urine pH to help prevent stones. Um, so if you have an animal who doesn't have a serious medical issue, you can feed a commercial diet. Um, and you'd want to check the label and make sure that they make a statement on there about that. But it's something that okay. pet food companies usually, it's kind of a standard internally that they're shooting for a, mm-hmm. a pH of the urine that won't um, encourage stones and formation. The, the veterinarian sometimes uses a terminology regarding an index level that is appropriate for that particular food provides this kidney index or whatever, and that's going to help minimize some of these special stones. So what Gail's referring to is that the stones that we end up with in our bladder or in our kidney, or even in our gallstone, or the gall bladder, um, are all related to metabolism of the body, okay? And diet okay. can influence that in many cases. Uh, I've seen okay. the best managed cats uh, have still returned with stones every, maybe if they're on the proper diet, instead of coming back frequently, it might be every four to six years you might see them come back. Um, it really depends. I think there's a genetic influence that has mm-hmm. to be considered and obviously isn't going to be a known. But again, this mm-hmm. is something, as Gail uh, inferred, you really do want to manage your animal's nutrition with your veterinarian because they're going to be your your best guide. Okay? Okay. Awesome. That sounds great. I appreciate everything. Thank you so much, Jan, and good Thanks. luck with your kitties. I know that's a kind of a nuisance kind of condition mm-hmm. and all there right, we have it kinda uh, is. it's hard to separate them all <laughs> yeah well i want to thank our fun. our listeners and our call-ins and we're going to take a, a break here we'll return uh with uh, all of us here dr doug at all things animal and all our guests here and a co-host and we will be talking about pet poisons around your household okay how much is that gorilla in the window take our advice at any Welcome back, everybody. We're uh, here to uh, visit again at Dr. Doug's All Things Animal radio show. And again, we have our wonderful co-host, Cindy Vickers. Hola. <laughs> and our guest who's been wonderful talking about nutrition with us, Gail Zarnecki. And I've invited Gail, if you want to, you're welcome to stay and listen to this section. Sure, I'd you love You may have to. some input. Uh, we're going to talk, our special topic talk session today is about pet poison concerns and control. And it happens to be, what is the event, it, Cindy? Well, it's um, Poison Awareness Month. Good. March is. Oh, okay, great. Pet Poison Awareness Month. I, th- I think it's uh, March 19th to the 25th is what I read. And I do want to put a number out real quickly. Uh, pet Poison Control Number. If you ever uh, find or have a concern about your pet having ingested or come exposed to something that might be a toxin and you can't get a hold of your vets, you certainly can call the emergency clinics around uh, St. Louis. We have some excellent people and they can direct you. But the number is 
Pet Poison Control, 888-299-2973. So that's a great aid. They will charge you, but they're going to give you a very complete understanding of what you're dealing with. So when I talk about poisons, and I talk to my clients about this, I want them to understand that there are you know, reasons and ways to work with poison con- conditions and controls. And you have to understand that um, you have to know more than, than uh, we're, we're able to know. So I want you to work closely with your professional veterinary support to know this. But some poisons that might come in uh, exposure to your pet are going to require vomiting induction. Others, you definitely don't want to encourage vomiting, like something that's very caustic or could irritate the lining, come back up. So that's number one. Many of the the drug-like poisons um, have a kind of what we call a threshold of toxicity so that it takes a certain concentration and certain volume of that concentration over a certain amount of time that's going to really either cause a problem or not be a problem. So as a pet owner, if you believe that your animal got exposed to something, some of the topics we're going to, uh, subjects we'll talk about in a second, then you want to be careful and alert to keep all information you can because your vet's going to question you about when do you think it happened? How much do you think he ate? Um, do you have any idea what he was exposed to? If it's a certain pill or whatever. So be alert as a pet owner that you want to have all the information at hand. And then again, other things like we've heard of uh, activated charcoal is a product that we use in humans as well, that if you have something that's toxic and you've ingested it, many times you want to use an activated charcoal product that coats the tummy and prevents absorption of that particular chemical. In other cases, it's been too long and the activated charcoal isn't going to be useful anyway. So again, the time, the information, anything you want to know about, you need to keep in mind. And finally, one more point about uh, toxicities and poisons. I see a real seasonality to many, and that's because there are certain classes of poisons like foodstuffs, uh, human foods that we are exposing our pets to, especially at holiday times, Christmas, Thanksgiving, uh, when everybody's around the table and all these goodies are everywhere that's when you're going to have desserts like chocolates you're going to have uh, bread puddings with uh, uh, with raisins or things like this all these products can be toxic so you want to be aware of that Um, uh, and when we're doing our springtime we're releasing the antifreeze out of our car believe it or not that's very sweet it's an alcohol and dogs and cats love that so and that's an extremely toxic product that's a kidney toxic product and again seasonality you talk about uh, animals that are kept in the garage during winter or they have to be downstairs those are places where we hide or support you know um, our drug our chemicals our gardening materials and all that kind of stuff we put it away make sure those areas are secure just like you're securing it for a child okay Mm -hmm. those are just some little alerts from dr doug so we're going to have cindy you said you had read recently about the 10 most common pet toxins do you have any information that you can share well they're similar but a little bit different for dogs and cats but you said some of them you know foods like chocolate and onion well you know the chocolate onions grapes raisins so the human foods yeah so you know kind of goes back to what we were talking about before you unless you really are a nutritionist or really know what you're doing about mm-hmm. feeding your pet, you think, well, I'm just going to give them this, you know, some raisins, right. you know, and dogs are also very clever about, I really like that. I'm going to go seek it out in the pantry. You mm-hmm. know, they find things sure. and they eat them. So right. I actually know a dog that died that way. You well, know? I know for uh, some statistics I saw said that in 2015, 2016, human food products that like you're describing were the number one cause of most poison uh, recordings to Mm -hmm. the veterinary community and uh, some of them can be life-threatening as we said we know so uh, several things on this list are um, are medicines for people antidepressants cold and allergy medications um, cardiac medications and ibuprofen naproxen but xylitol which is a artificial or sweetener that's an artificial Mm -hmm. sweetener in gum yeah well and in toothpaste oh And, and some peanut butters Oh, really? Yeah. You have to watch out for peanut butter, the sugar-free ones. That's scary because we've been 
feeding peanut butter to medicate our pets for mm-hmm. a thousand years. Yeah. Well, yeah. things things are you know the little silica packets that are in are not highly Drying toxic, pack, but yeah. they are you know you're in like the little medicine bottles and right. and other things, um, they're toxic. So I, I just you know I sort of always go back to training, but I think you don't ever want to assume that your dog won't eat that. You know mm-hmm. you you just can't leave stuff laying around till you're well if first of all if you know it's poisonous you want to put it away but in general until you have a dog that's pretty stable and you can count on them you, well, they, puppies they will and be kittens shocking. are going to explore everything mm-hmm. and you're right that's the other big category of poisonings is the over-the-counter drugs and you know who would have thunk you know yeah. but, but that's uh listed by um the humane society is that was like one or two behind the um i think right behind the food stuff here's one that i wouldn't think of but if you have a little kid this comes up glow sticks oh. toxic to animal lilies uh, household cleaners sure. um something else is not exactly poisonous but it's it can be just really problematic and it has to do with what dogs ingest uh what you put in your trash if you have things in your trash that it mm-hmm. could be at least but interesting you really need to have that secured Secure. away too and mm-hmm. again this i mean it could just be overeating could be choking mm-hmm. on things that they you know they really can't ingest or swallow mm-hmm. very well and i actually one time personally i had opened a soup can but i didn't op- i didn't take the top completely off i went like seven eighths of the way around the dog got in the trash got their tongue mm. stuck between that sharp lid and, and the, the can and it was 15 minutes trying to get it out and it wasn't pretty and you know they they get into things you just have to be you have to really think about I, I, what mm-hmm. they might like yeah i tell people it's like managing your children you know, and it's the same thing whether you're training a dog to a, through a crate. You know, it's like a baby that doesn't have a diaper running around the house. Yeah, this is the same thing. We have to protect them from themselves until, like you said, they mature enough to be consistently safe. And I think so. Sometimes it's good to hear these things because it mm-hmm. just doesn't occur to you that the dog can't eat this tube of toothpaste. Well, you probably didn't think the dog would eat the tube of toothpaste, but there's, you know, but but they might. Absolutely. <laughs> well, and I know my dog um, is usually pretty reliable, but I was trying to get her to lose weight, and she got very tricky about stealing food uh-huh. and stealing things that I never would have thought she would have tried to eat. I'm pretty tricky yeah. about that, too, yeah. especially after hours. My wife's asleep. I get right into the <laughs> kitchen and the pantry. Well, and let me, dogs are pretty clever, and cats, too, about mm-hmm. they can open doors. They can open a lot of doors, sliding doors and mm-hmm. things they yep. can get their paw under. If, mm-hmm. if, it's, mm-hmm. you know, if, they're, if it's interesting enough and the you have a clever animal. I want to mention the plants because um, although there are a lot of super toxic plants, even oak trees, every part of the oak tree, the bark, the acorns, everything is toxic, the leaves, uh, but we don't see them eating enough of that to create problems. And um, in many cases, when you're talking about plant toxicities, the animals will only eat enough that they get nauseated and thankfully they'll vomit. Mm-hmm. So we don't see many. But can't you feed pigs acorns? Well, you know, we see that when I was in the zoo world, we would have, you know, giraffes and rhinos and everything eating the limbs and the acorns. And I always thought, well, wait a minute, I was taught these are uh, kidney toxic. Why are we allowing this? And yet the animals never demonstrated, I guess they don't need enough volume that they're going to mm-hmm. get sick. Well, so. I, as I said earlier, have you read uh, East of Eden by John Steinbeck? And this comes up in the book. Okay. I said they're going to have a contest to gather acorns to feed the pigs. Ah. I, thought it was I don't brilliant. know. So that's why you asked that question. Mm-hmm. I, you really I thought you looked like I knew something. Great assimilation. Mm-hmm. Another really important toxin I like to mention because I deal with it all the time are the mouse and rat poisons oh, yeah. so, now these chemicals are so effective they have been designed to be super toxic and then for any other mammal that uh, happens to ingest especially a cat ingesting a, 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 a toxic dead mouse mm. or rats or can be exposed to that you know our pets are really in jeopardy and again it's about how much do they eat the concentration and the particular product they're eating and um, that's that's a real concern, and it's also something you have to get to your vet right away if you're going to get them to vomit, if mm-hmm. that's appropriate. But the other scary part about that kind of toxin is that sometimes it takes weeks before you see a an event, and then it can be a full bleed out of their urine or their feces, or they vomit up, and then they're they're on their way out. 
Um, mm. I'm trying to think of one more toxin I wanted to mention. Of course, the cleaning products. Uh, we mentioned ethylene glycol f- from the antifreeze. Um, you mentioned all the NSAIDs, which are the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. I think as humans, we're going to find out that all the abuse we've accomplished with ibuprofen, the Tylenol products, those are very, very toxic to our liver and our kidney. Here's a big one. Um, pesticides. Pesticides, absolutely. And that goes with that stuff you're storing in your basement or well, your... And you get your lawn treated. Yeah. And you yeah, don't you forget yeah. the guy, yeah. somebody right. comes once a month and then your dog or cat goes out there and... Yeah. You know, they're... Pesticides and fertilizers. They're mm-hmm. very toxic. Well, I think our time is just about up. So we're going to be back with Dr. Doug's All Things Animal in just a moment. We'll do a wrap up. And I appreciate all the great information that Gail, that you offered us. But let's Thank you. see you in just a moment. He's a king, bottom of everything. He's the most tip-top, top cat, top cat. Welcome back to our final segment of Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio Show. And I want to start by thanking Gail Zarnecki. She's been here for another topic that she's very uh, in- and passionate about, and that's special training uh, that helps people with new children uh, kind of coordinating the animal in the house with the family in the house. Right. Is yeah. that the best way? To, I mean, Yeah, that's a good way to describe it, and thank you for having me. Oh, no, you've been wonderful. You have so much experience and so much information for us regarding nutrition, so that was our first topic. And She's I thought, a genius. She is a genius. <laughs> I don't know uh, about that. Well, we know it's a broad subject. We'll probably come back to it on another show because there's so many different aspects to share, uh, but nutrition is so important. We have so many choices, and again, I would say, you know, whatever you learn online is great, but throw that at your veterinarian and make sure that everybody's on target with the same thinking and you know we we didn't talk about this in the show but animals sometimes are fed by their life stage so and Mm -hmm. that's really important too because that's going to mandate what kind of food you need so if it's a puppy or a kitten versus a uh, a breeding program a mother that needs special nutrition during pregnancy a working dog that's out there hunting they all need or an older Mm -hmm. dog they all need their own consideration so that's really important and don't ignore the obvious like gail said if they're if their teeth are bad if they're overweight if they're underweight if their coat is not sort of lustrous and healthy yeah. You're already, this is like after the fact, so. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's telling you to do something. Right. Mm-hmm. But it was a great subject and um, great information. The other portion of our show, we spoke about the poisons and uh, all the concerns we have around the household. My general rule would be, again, treat your pet and manage your pets like you do your young children. They don't, we can't expect them to understand or differentiate right from wrong, especially in this regard. So we have to be responsible pet owners and it Cindy is, what was that event it's National Poison Awareness Week from March 16th through the 25th wonderful and finally I wanted to invite our listeners to join our Facebook group Dr. Doug's All Things Animal Radio and we'd love to have you join us and learn more about what we're doing and we're trying to provide a lot of good education and entertainment if you need to get a hold of us Clarkson Wilson Vet dot com is our website and if you need some training support uh cindy vickers is great and she's welcome welcoming your calls calls at 636-530-1808 and we'll be happy to help you through one final note is our topic for next week will involve you know how you manage your pets in preparation for travel whether it's by plane car train or whatever And spring break's coming up, so I think this will be a useful topic for our listeners. Thank you.